Hey, in this segment, we're going to deal with another part of creation. Last time we discussed the uh, creation of the material universe, and I said very little, if anything, about the immaterial or um, invisible or spiritual aspect of the universe, which is just as real as the visible and the Christian worldview is supernatural to the core and we you know we need to remember that. So in a sense this is part two. I want to deal um, with the topic of demons um, but not in the typical way that I guess you would in systematic theology where you talk about um, their origins, their nature, uh, and so forth. Instead, um, I want to ask this question. Are demons, unclean spirits, and fallen angels the same thing according to Scripture? Are demons, unclean spirits, and fallen angels the same thing? Now, some of you may be saying, of course they are. And others of you are saying, of course they're not. Which is, of course, why I'm doing this. Because I know that um, for the last 10 years in which I have been dealing with this, um, there is a lot of disagreement over this issue. And as I said, I'm not really dealing with demons per se, but I, th I think it's a significant issue, significant enough uh, to address. And uh, I don't like to speak of my own demonic experiences. I have peered over the rim of hell, and one does not battle the demonic without being forever changed. A debate, a big debate, rages amongst not only paranormal investigators, but also amongst pastors, Christian deliverance ministers, and Christians in general, as to the identity of demons. In particular, there seems to be a widespread confusion due to drawing distinctions between demons, unclean spirits, and fallen angels. Um... What's the big deal, you ask? Well, first, God's word is a big deal. And rightly dividing it regarding any issue is significant and important. But practically speaking, is there a difference in how to deal with these entities if they are, in fact, different? Because they are generally thought to differ in strength and authority, according to the people who say they are different. Does this affect one's view of spiritual warfare and who we are fighting? Are we fighting multiple foes? Or is it like traditionally Satan and his demons? If they are different, how can we tell which is which? Or can we? Do we need to take extra caution with one more than another? Is the name of Jesus authoritative over all three? Are there, like I said, are there different things we need to do in, in uh, situations in which there's an infestation of, say, fallen angels and where you may not have to do it with unclean spirits? So when it comes to demonology or any area, I'm willing to admit when I'm I'm not sure about something. Because just this morning I told a dear friend that I, I was pretty sure what Genesis 6, 1 and following teaches. But the more we talked, uh, uh, the less certain I was. And I think we should be willing to say, I don't know when we don't know. However, since the Word of God is truth, we can have absolute certitude without being arrogant when the Bible is clear on a matter. And I have studied this issue enough to see that the Bible is clear 
clear enough for me to say this is the truth you can accept it or you can reject it but it is the truth from God's word hemming and hawing when the Bible is clear is not humility friends it's, it's a subtle form of pride actually bowing before God's absolute sovereign authority as our Lord includes believing what he teaches in his inerrant word may I ask this are you willing to change your mind if I can show you from God's word that the three are, in fact, synonymous. A soft, teachable heart that is willing to change one's mind, not regarding non-essentials, regarding, regarding essentials, we don't want to change our minds, but regarding non-essentials, we should be willing to be open, be good Bereans, I suppose, as one could put it. That's a lovely trait, being teachable, but it's not especially common, sadly. We have a lot of uh, self-taught Bible and theology experts who are causing some problems on Facebook and elsewhere. Um, we should have respect for the teachers and pastors that God has placed over us. Um, that's the proper thing to do, and it's what the Bible says. But to state the obvious, they're not infallible, and only God can bind your conscience via his word regarding this issue. Also, just because a person has a long, successful career as a deliverance minister or exorcist, does not make their opinion on this matter infallible either. Um, if God, you know, God waits until we're perfect to use us, then he'll never use any of us. And it's exceedingly foolish and naive for those who are in the paranormal community or, or any, any, anyone to identify entities according to their appearance because of the angel of light principle in 2 Corinthians 11 and 14, where Satan can appear as an angel of light, which means he can appear, him and his demons, as anything. Using one's five senses to determine the truth regarding this issue is unwise in the extreme. Some folks have a long list of distinct entities that allegedly populate the spirit realm, all based on perception which would include believing EVPs. Satan and demons are expert liars and deceivers, so it's foolish to believe any voice is caught via a means particularly condemned by God. And the alleged distinctions between um, demons, unclean spirits, and fallen angels, or Satan's angels, are often based on the same fallacy of identification via experience or appearance. Let me ask this question. <laughs> Try to visualize this. If you saw an eight-foot Baphomet or Baphomet looking spirit with long horns and red eyes, would it be more wicked and more powerful than, say, a little boy spirit that you saw? Or perhaps a shadow man with a hat? Or a black-eyed kids? See, the tendency, contrary to Occam's razor, is to multiply the number of entities in the spirit realm. When the Bible clearly teaches that there are only two kinds of creatures that populate the spirit realm. Good angels and bad angels. I'll show in, in a moment. Both of which are called multiple names in order to call attention to their different ranks and or to accentuate a particular aspect. Just as angels and Jesus himself has many names but the same person, so it is with demons. Why distinguish between these ent three entities I've mentioned if they can be shown to be the same? As Occam's razor suggests, we should prefer the simpler explanation, 
with less variables if it explains the phenomena. And affirming that demons, unclean spirits, and fallen bad angels or Satan's angels are the same thing not only does justice to Occam's razor, but much more importantly, it does justice to the basic interpretive or hermeneutical principle of comparing Scripture with Scripture, the, the analogy of Scripture principle. And we're going to do that. Scripture alone must be our guide in this debate. That's the only thing that can decide, because uh, as I said, our senses are, are worthless when it comes to d deciding this. And so I will unabashedly and unashamedly use a fair amount in this. So when you jump in, I uh, want to show that the Gospels clearly reveal that demons and unclean spirits, I'm going to start with those two first, show that demons and unclean spirits are the same thing. And then we'll look at fallen angels or uh, the devil's angels. And, and by the way, the verses, I texts I have taken from the Gospels were almost at random because you could take almost any um, text that deals with exorcism in the Gospels and then look at its parallel in a different gospel, and you'll probably see the principle that I'm about to explain here, where um, unclean spirits um, is used in place of demons and vice versa. But let's look at Mark 5, starting at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, what I want you to what I want you to, to watch is to see the use of language and how it flows from the use of one word, unclean spirit, to the use of another one, demon. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, that's Penumita Acartarto. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. Jumping down to verse 8. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. And he gave him permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. Now, check this out, verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And, back up. Let's see, I lost my place there for a second. The okay, the herdsmen fled. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and to see what it what had happened. Okay, right. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon possessed man, Daimone Zamanon, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described it to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from that region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged that he might go with him. So you see what's going on there? Is that there's just a clear flow of narrative in which in the beginning, the entity or entities are referred to as unclean spirits, and then with no fanfare, it is then called demons, as if the original audience would have said, of course, they're, they're the same thing. So it's just a clear natural transition. And um, if we had just one text that really should 
resolve the issue, but let's read another one, okay? And I want to, here's the, when I talked about, you know, comparing parallel passages, um, here's a, an example of that. Um, the same incident in Mark 9 and Matthew 17 uses two different words, okay? So for Mark 9, we have, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. Okay, there you have clearly Jesus calling it an unclean spirit, right? Same incident in Matthew 17, picking up um, verse see, 17, I think. How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Okay, so there you have, again, clearly the same incident in one, in one gospel is called unclean spirit. The gospel is a demon. Okay, now I want to show you a text in which the, the two words are actually used in the same text um, with the Syrophoenician um, incident. Coming from, um, well, let me jump in, okay. And from there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Okay, just a verse before is an unclean spirit. Now it's a demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed. Uh, jumping down to verse 29. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Okay, those are just, those are just a few of the numerous passages I've came across with the same phenomenon. Um, there's several instances where parallel passages in the Gospels where one, one writer calls them demons and the other writer, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, both of them, um, one calls them unclean spirit, the other one calls them a demon. And didn't cause a problem for the original audience, as I said, because they, they knew it was the same thing. And I'm trying to help you to see that they are the same thing. It's important to me that the body of Christ not be confused, particularly about our enemy. We need to be clear as to who we are fighting. And um, if we can't even be clear as to who our enemy is, then you know, that's, that's, an, that's, that's an issue. I've read numerous articles and books which do distinguish between these three, and, and usually they, they attempt to, to use the Bible to um, buttress their arguments. Um, obviously not very well, but, uh, but, and they also say that usually one of these beings, and I think it's usually the fallen angel said to be stronger than the other. And in addition, um, it's perhaps significant that those who do distinguish between uh, unclean spirits and demons also tend to believe in some form of trapped human spirits. That's not always the case, so you know, there's exceptions. As we noted before, when dealing with God's word, um, we're 
ordered by God himself to be as accurate as possible. And um, that that is our main main concern. But you know, misinterpreting scripture is 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 a sin. Um, it's a failure to love God with all of our minds. Second, once you begin multiplying spirit entities, uh, confusion is bound to follow. For example, is this house occupied by demons or is it occupied by unclean spirits or fallen angels? So confusion from the outset, because some say that the way you would deal with unclean spirits and demons it is the same way, but others would say no, is you deal differently with different entities, and why not? I mean, and then third, once the multiplying of spirit beings has begun, it's easy to step on the slippery slope of introducing additional beings, for example, purgatorial dead, malevolent human dead, elemental spirits. But most importantly, we're simply to be consumed with accurate exegesis and interpretation, handling the precious oracles of God with immense care. You know, my purpose is not to analyze the specifics of these texts, but to ask, does the Bible differentiate between unclean spirits and demons? Are they different or the same? That's the issue before us. And... Um, I chose these passages almost at random, and I uh, just would urge you again, or encourage you to to do your own study um, of of this issue. But I hope that by reading God's Word, that you can see the clarity that uh, that I have, and that I've come to what I call cognitive rest regarding this issue. My mind is um, uh, it, um, I have a certainty that this is the truth and I'm willing to be able to state it with firmness because God's word is so clear as we saw. And uh, the Holy Spirit uses demons and unclean spirits to center them in sin. And <laughs> the Bible frequently frequently uses multiple terms for the same being to accent accent different things. As I said before, Jesus himself had many names and titles, but they all refer to one and the same divine person. They all accent different facets of his person and work. Satan has multiple names as well. So why all the fuss about, you know, the different distinctions uh, between spirits and uh, unclean spirits and demons and fallen angels? And I've seen some really outrageous comments in, in deliverance books and in deliverance circles um, about this issue. So... Uh, if you've read these passages or listened carefully, it should be obvious that um, when the Gospels speak about unclean spirits and demons, they, they are in fact synonyms. So how about fallen or bad angels or Satan's angels? Well, um, do you remember the text in Matthew 25, the classic text on the last judgment? It be, you have a kind of a parallel, um, a, um, I guess you could say a um, very similar pattern of um, expression and verbiage between the positive and the negative. Um, in verse, starting at verse 31, I am, I am, I am having trouble reading. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And then as he go, as you know, it goes on to say, blessed are those who have 
done this. I was hungry and you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then in a parallel way, he says to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Diablo Kai Tois Angelus Atu. It's the same thing in the Greek as it is in English, or vice versa, the devil and his angels. This is not a special discussion of the devil and his angels. The fact that this is the last judgment dealing with us, with people, with the devil. So why would he pull in some kind of, you know, exotic rank of known as fallen angels, the devil's, the devil's angels, uh, at this point, no, what these are, it's obvious that the devil and his angels, what is re being referred to are the rank and file demons or unclean spirits that we do battle with daily, as seen in Ephesians 6. They are, the, the devil and his angels are synonymous with demons, unclean spirits, condemned along with Satan. Um there would be no reason to introduce a, a new category at this point. Um, so I want to read, uh, again, comparing scripture with scripture. Let's move to Revelation, and I want to, to show the compare chapters 12 and 16. All righty. So, starting at verse 7, chapter 12, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. So we know that's Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So he's referring here to uh, the devil and his demons, but in this case they are called his angels. Okay, the dragon and his angels are then it's clarified as Satan, as we as we already knew. Now, I want us to see um, how it's, it's uh, clarified even more in um, chapter 16. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up to prepare the way for the kings for from the east. And I saw, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits. Ring a bell? Like frogs. For they are demonic spirits. Okay. Pause. Three unclean spirits, for they are demonic spirits. They are demonic spirits right next to each other. Performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay, um, so that obviously is the, the last battle. And you have there... The coming together 
of uh, the confluence of these what is called um, unclean spirits and then in the next phrase the same entities are called demonic spirits and they're clearly referring to the same entities which three or four chapters earlier are called the devil's angels All right okay so um, what are called devil's angels in chapter 12 are called unclean spirits and demons in chapter 16. And it's clearly referring to the same beings, which is consistent with Matthew 25. Again, the, the, the basic hermeneutical principle is comparing scripture with scripture. And if we, if we look back to Matthew 25, and if we have an open mind, like, like we should, a teachable one, soft, moldable one, then the verbiage is the same. The devil, Satan, and his angels. That's exactly what's being talked about in Revelation. But they are also called unclean spirits and demonic spirits. So, um, to me it's clear, and it should be, should be to you, that the devil or fallen angels, unclean spirits, and demons are synonymous. Okay. Again, what does this all mean? 24-7, we are in spiritual warfare. The supernatural realm is just as real as the natural realm. As I said, um, Christianity, the Christian worldview, is supernatural to the core. And I've had uh, experiences which have reminded me, um, which I guess the average Christian hasn't, but I wouldn't, even if I hadn't, that still would realize that the... Uh, the common sense uh, idea that to know our enemy is is good. I mean, it's, it's only proper strategy. And if we are not clear on um, who these three things are, then good gravy, what what are we clear on? How can we fight against what we're confused? How can we fight accurately against what we're confused about? And that's what I'm trying to do is not just quibble about words. I'm not quibbling about these three words. I'm trying to equip you for to be um, a more effective warrior for Christ. And you can't do that when you're confused. Okay? So. While we're at it, let me discuss something else real quickly and to throw in the mix the phrase elemental spirits. If you know anything about the paranormal realm and that whole issue, then you know that the paranormal community talks a lot about elemental spirits. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement as to who or what they are. Uh, again, because there's there's a sense that the principle of sola scriptura doesn't hold sway there. Of course, there's going to be all kinds of disagreement. Um, and But generally, they are connected with being nature spirits, protectors of nature. Uh, at least that's how I've heard, generally heard it. And... Um, so, but we see in Colossians 2, verse 8, this actual phrase used, elemental spirits. And it's, it's ironic, deeply ironic, uh, because the very ideas that are of elemental spirits in the paranormal community is an expression of elemental spirits. Uh, biblically, and what I mean by that is the elemental spirits is yet a fourth term for the demonic. Uh, 
stoicheia or um, as it's um, uh, interpreted as uh, uh, in different ways, but it's uh, either elemental principles or ele elementary um, spirits. And um, it, it's clear that what he's talking about, the false philosophy that Paul is, Paul is warning the Colossians to not be taken in by the seeming plausible philosophy of the false teachers. Um, his argument is very similar to John's in 1 John 4, where he talks about how the false teachers, their teaching is animated by the Antichrist. Okay? That is, the demonic is behind the, 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 their false teaching. And that's what Paul is saying. He's just using a different word, stoicheia. Um, his vocabulary for the demonic was pretty, pretty vast. He knew, had a, a comprehensive understanding of of ancient and for his time contemporary literature and philosophy. So what you had is that he had he was warning um, the brothers and sisters about being deceived of plausible sounding philosophies that elevated angels and as a result denigrated Christ and that these false teachers were um, animated by stoicheia um, which would be when you compare it with that's in verse 8 compare that with the um, verse 10 or verse 15, which is clearly demonic, the principalities and powers, which he disarmed in verse 15, then um, that uh, the idea that stoicheia is demonic is, is um, uh, buttressed when you compare, again, scripture to scripture, verse 10 or verse 15, that the stoicheia were disarmed um, by Christ on the cross, the rulers and authorities. It's just another name for, for demons. So, but that was not my main intent. It was just uh, an added extra at the, at the end there. But my main intent in this segment was to, in our session on or uh, set in the segment on systematic theology was to clarify or try to bring some clarity to what is for some people a very confused um, issue. And, uh, you know, where there's confusion, there can be problems. And, um, Bottom line, I just hope and pray that tonight has helped to bring some light and clarity to you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the light and the truth. And I pray that you would take whatever words that I said that were of you, uh, particularly your holy word, and that you would use that whatever was of you that to bear fruit for your glory. And I pray in the name of Jesus, who disarmed the stoicheia, the principalities and powers, the fallen angels, the demons, and the unclean spirits. And we thank you for the clarity of your word. And we know that spiritual warfare is real, and we cling to the cross of Christ, white-knuckled. 
Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.